Hi there, my name is Gary and I'm one of the pastors here at Westview Baptist Church in Calgary. Listen, we're really grateful that you are joining us. Uh, many of you are attending our services in person and a lot of you are also connecting with us on live stream and listening to our podcasts. And that's one of the reasons we're here uh, now is we just wanted to drop in and let you know that we are aware of some of the technical difficulties uh, that we have encountered. Uh, and we have a great team that's working to resolve those as quickly as we can. And so we're thankful for your patience and we hope that you will continue to return to our live stream or to our website, westviewbaptistchurch.ca and our podcasts. We're thankful that you are here and we look forward to continuing our relationship with you online and in person. Take care. Verses 2 to verse 6, Jeremiah 31. Thus says the Lord, The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you and you shall be built. O virgin Israel, again, you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. And we hear in this section this pattern that is um, accentuated with the word again. He, he repeats this word again and again and again because as I was demonstrating last week, the Lord has this pattern in which He relates to the people of God. And they find themselves again, the people of God find themselves again in exile, in, in captivity, in a foreign land, in Babylon. But He reminds them of this pattern that He has this pattern of rescue. He has this pattern of deliverance. And he says, I continue again. I'm going to do this again. And he says, and again and again, because he has this pattern. And he says, the reason for it is because of my everlasting love. And everlasting. That is a love that has no end. It is a love without an off switch. So he just says again, and he says, the reason also is because of my faithfulness, my fidelity, my loyalty. Interestingly, he has a faithfulness to his mission, but also he has a faithfulness to the people of God. He has a faithfulness to his creation. A faithfulness, even though they are, in spite of their being rebellious, in spite of sinfulness, in spite of turning, he has a faithfulness to them in any case. It reminds me, he, 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 at one point he talks about being like a good shepherd, concerned for a wayward sheep. It reminds me of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Well, really, the parable of the running, dancing father who is looking and concerned for the wayward son. So the Lord recalls. He recalls and re reminds them. When you were chased by the Egyptian army. I was there. And miraculously helped you through. What looked like impossible. To you it was. But with me it was not impossible. I parted the water. You made it through. And there was this spontaneous tambourine singing and dancing on the other side. He reminded them of that. You survived. He reminded them when they had wandered in the desert because of their rebellious ways, because their refusal, but they wandered. He reminded them of his presence, his protection, even his provision for them while they were in this desolate desert time. He reminded them of these things. 
So what does he say now after reminding them? What does he invite them to do now while they are still in exile? Verse 7 of Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together, a great company. They shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And here he says, what I want you to do is start worshiping. (laughs) They're in exile, and he says, there's going to be a reason, there is a reason. This is a call to worship. Can you imagine the people in exile And the Lord is saying, start worshiping. This is a call to worship. Sing. Praise the Lord. Proclaim His greatness. Testify to His greatness. Sing aloud. And He says, even pray, plead with the Lord. Notice His goodness. Notice the beauty of creation. Notice what he is doing. See, he says, and testify. Plead and say this to the Lord. And he says, you will come together. As you worship, you will come together. In fact, he not only proclaims it, he says, I will draw you together. And it will be this diverse group. Do you notice what he says? It will be from all parts of, Every ethnicity, different languages, those that can walk and those that cannot walk. Those that can see and those that cannot. Those that are filled with joy and those that are filled with sorrow. Those that are anxious and those that are calm. All will come. But why, why worship? Why assemble together? What Why would the people of God do that? Why would they do that? You know, it's no wonder to me that there is a lot of conflict in the category of worship. There's trouble with worship. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase, worship wars. But there used to be these these conflicts because people would get upset about the, the ways and the what's Related to worship. Well, it's a certain kind of music. It has to be a certain kind of music. Well, it's actually worship is music. No, it's not music. It has to be a certain kind of music. My music. Uh, Drums, yes. Drums, no. On the first and third beat or on the second and fourth beat? Uh, Should there be notes or no notes? Should there be harmony or no harmony? Should you stand? Should you sit? Should you wave your arms? Should you keep them to your side? Is it a 56-inch TV? And that's just the half of it, right? We're just, I mean, we could go on just, you know. We know that there's more to worship. Prayer. Sacrifice. Service. Giving of our time, our effort, our finances, tithes and offering. All of that, yes, but all of that is the what of worship. It still doesn't answer the question why. But if we're paying attention and we're quiet, maybe we can start to get hints of the why answer to why we worship. When we talk amongst ourselves and we hear and maybe we say phrases like, well, I was edified. I 
was blessed. I enjoyed that. And that's good. But it reveals an orientation where the I is the center, where the I is the object and the aim. And it even reveals this business of individualism when actually we are coming together and yet the I is prominent even though we are together. Interesting. We struggle. We struggle. And you know, we struggle with individualism. We struggle with being the center of our own lives, of being kings and queens and the thrones of our own life. We kind of want to do it my way and my preference. But it's also exacerbated by this, the, the prowling, lying, devilish enemy of our souls who is stirring up currents of individualism. Individualism, which washes over human beings and can even flood the church where we think about the individual and not the group, the corporate body. And it's interesting to me that so much of Scripture is actually addressed to the congregation and not merely the individual. So, Lord Jesus, remind us again, Lord, this morning, why we worship and why we assemble together. And you cannot deny when we hear this morning and we hear all of us singing, when we hear our voices together, it is profound. It is much more lovely. And it is not just because I can't sing, but it is lovely to hear the group of voices singing together. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands, Far away. Say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd of flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the, sh and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden and they shall never languish again. The reason why we worship, the reason why they worship, the reason he gave was that it was their response. He said, you will worship out of a response to God the Father. It will be your response to him. It is your response to God's everlasting love. It is your love response to God's love. It is because we love the Lord who loves us. Worship is our yes to Him. It is our yes to Him regardless of the circumstances of life. And even regardless of the consequences, it is our yes to Him. And consequently, it is also a no. It is a no to self-centeredness. It is a no to individualism. It is a no to my ways only. It is a yes. It is our yes in response to the Lord. I wonder if we know the difference. You know, I was thinking about this idea of the difference between a response and a reaction. Um, and I, I was wondering, you know, a response, our worship as a response. The reason why do you worship if the answer is because I am responding in love to the Lord. It is my yes to the Lord as a response, not a reaction. And there's quite a bit of, can you see there's quite a bit of water in there, Right? So if I were to go like this, oh, okay, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. I wasn't nice. I will, I will buy you whatever coffee from whatever shop. I thank you for being willing to do that. 
Um, I, I, I was going to, I, thank you. Um, I am feeling like I owe <laughs> some large thanks to uh, Sarah. That is a reaction. That is not the response that I'm talking about or that the Lord was describing here. That is a reaction. There's no thought that goes into it. There isn't a choice that goes into it. In a way, uh, Dr. Condal, who uh, does a lot of uh, uh, work in the area of memory, he talks about implicit memory and explicit memory. And so we're talking about a choice. A response is a choice that we make. Not a reaction, but it is thinking, what has the Lord done? Who is the Lord? What does He mean? And then choosing effortfully, choosing to say yes. Choosing love. Choosing a response that is worship. It's kind of like you, when you ride a bicycle, you don't give a lot of thought to it. That's implicit memory. You don't think about it. You just go ahead and do it. But a response requires a moment and a pause and a choice. If I were to ask you, who are you? You would think for a moment. You would need to respond. You would take a moment. You might say your name. You might talk about what you do. But the question, who are you? Is a question of identity. Will you come to this banquet that we are having? That's an invitation. Actually, the Lord says, Come, <laughs> come. That is the response. And friends, it is a matter of faith. And this great company that he is describing, when people do that, when they respond and they come together, he says it is the gathered group that is a testimony to his greatness. It is precisely the assembled group that is a testimony. Because we choose to come together. It is a gathered group of people that are diverse. Precisely because of the diversity from different places and different ethnicities. But because we are united at the same time. Not that we are uniform, but that we are united. It is this that gives testimony to the greatness of God. When we come together and we honor and we praise and we worship, he says you are radiant. That is a radiance, like a light to the world, like a city on a hill. It's the assembly that is a testimony to each other. We hear and we see each other, but also to those that are wondering, what is the Lord like and why is it that you come together? Why do you wake up and get up and go on a Sunday morning? And then he continues. He says, the Lord gathers and the Lord keeps. It reminds me of Psalm 121, the great keeper. He says, the Lord gathers and keeps. He says, listen, I have paid a ransom. That language is from like even business back in the Old Testament days. He says, there was a cost to this family that I am assembling. There is a cost to it. A price that I have paid. A son that I have given. Ultimately, he knew then already when he said this ransom, the son that I have freely given, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself up. He delivered himself to rescue us, deliver us from evil once and for all. The just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And John writing in the, John chapter 1 says, all those who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that was already understood here. The Lord is a rescuer, he is a keeper and a gatherer, and he has paid the price. And the ownership has transferred. And you are his. 
You are His. You are His. To all those that receive and believe in His name, ownership has transferred. Now we are family members of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But he goes on. He continues. It could be enough. We could stop there, but he doesn't. He goes on. In verse 13 and 14. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance. And the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness. And my people shall be satisfied with my bounty. (laughs) That sounds like a party. I mean, there is dance, there is merry. What he is saying is that when the gathered assembly comes together, It is, first of all, the reason is because of our yes. The reason is, I love the Lord. That's why I get together to be part, and I'm part of a family, and we get together. That's why. And then he says, that family, when you get together, uh, you are this testimony. But there's more, he says, he, he, he lavishes his extravagant love upon us, that when the family gets together, he says, I will transform you. You will change as you are together. When you are together in this gathering, something else goes on. Something happens, and you are transformed. He says, I will comfort you. You are coming with sorrow and sadness, and I will comfort you. I promise to comfort you. Whether you are coming with joy and celebration, and I will be there, I will celebrate with you. Do you notice the fruit of the Spirit that Paul describes in Galatians, that trio of triplets, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all of that requires relationship. It requires community, kindness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. All of that grows when we're together. We are transformed into His likeness, into His family. We are transformed. Worship is all that. It sounds a lot like what heaven will be like When Jesus Christ returns, it is described at various times as a banquet feast. It's described as a party. Come on, just admit it. It sounds like that. It sounds... But it isn't only in heaven. It isn't only when Jesus Christ returns. It is meant for now already. It is meant for the family of God with this great loving Heavenly Father Enabled because of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is present with us, who is praying and interceding for us, as Sarah was talking about, whose Holy Spirit enables and equips us. We are meant to gather already now so that His kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. And so the question, why we gather? Why do we worship? It is our yes to Him. It is our love to Him. It is our obedience to Him. And He is our focus. Our Heavenly Father is our focus of worship. He is the one we've come to. He is the one we pray to. He is the one we sing about. We are joined by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are united with Him. And He is interceding and praying. We are The Lord is present here by His Holy Spirit, but He is our audience. And you know, when the Lord is our audience, when He is the one, when He is the focus and when He is the aim, then it actually frees us. It frees us from the constraints and concerns uh, that we might have, that our neighbors might be wondering what they're what they might be saying about us or what, you know, if we're, what, the way we're doing it or this or that. And we're freed because it's the Lord Jesus Christ that we've come to worship and praise. And really, often when I talk to congregants after the worship service, they go, you know, uh, I really wanted to, but, uh, you know, I was a little concerned. Actually, we all really do want to express ourselves openly and freely in spirit and in truth. 
uh, Kimberly and I were visiting some friends of ours in Kinshasa, Congo. And we were blown away by the time of worship that we had there. This uh, top was made for us um, when we were in Kinshasa. Um, uh, Kimberly also has a, a matching skirt and top. She thought it might be too much if she wore that while I wore this. Um, but if you want her to wear it, you can talk to her and, and, uh, and convince her. But, but our friends were in Kinshasa, and uh, we had these. We actually had another one made uh, or given to us uh, from the orphanage that we were visiting there. Uh, but So I wear this because of my friends in Kinshasa. But what was happening when we went to the worship service there is that at some point, actually during the worship, dancing broke out. I don't mean, you know, that. I mean dancing. I mean people got into the aisles and they were dancing. <laughs> you know? Um, they, and I mean, there was a line. People, they, you know, the, it's actually, I think the right word is Congo line, not Congo line. Because they were dancing together and it was just celebratory. And for that time, it was beautiful and it was wonderful. And we joined in. And you know how they say hello and they greet each other is we touch foreheads. Can you imagine? Right? But that's what we were doing. And it was just a celebration and it was worship. And we were honoring the Lord and that was going on. And friends, I want to tell you something. Kinshasa, where this church is located... There's about 12, 14 million people in this city. They have rotating outages, electrical outages to conserve because there's only a fraction, a few people that have all the money, the government and the military and everything else. They have an open sewer system. So when we get to the church, the gutters are full of garbage and whatever else, and we step over that and we get into the doors, and that's where the dancing is happening. Are you with me? We have so much to learn. But it's not only dancing. We went to visit friends of ours in Oaxaca, Mexico. And they were spending years with a um, uh, Ureni Zapotec community up in a, a mountain region. And, and they had established another church further down the mountain. And we went early on a Sunday morning to be with them early. <laughs> and they were gathering in what we would have called like just a really, really large shed. But that was their church building. And we joined with them for a service that was close to two hours. Oh, and they set up chairs too. The white plastic lawn chairs. That's what they set up in their sanctuary. And as we were sitting there during singing, and at one point, Kimberly uh, joined a, a friend of ours, Grace, and they sang a song. But over and over again, they would pray. They would just break into prayer. And I kept remembering this phrase, gracias Dios, gracias Dios, gracias Dios. And they're just praying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As we're sitting on these hard plastic white chairs. And they're just worshiping and praising the Lord. <laughs> We've got a lot to learn from our friends. It takes faith to worship. It's a big step of faith to worship because we're separated from Jesus right now. Physically separated from Him. Uh, we can't see Him. We can't hear him walking in the atrium. We can't touch his cloak, the hem of his garment. So it takes faith. But when we come together and we worship together, something happens and it pierces the invisible and, and it becomes visible. And it becomes tangible. And not only do we know it, but we begin to experience it and we understand it and we are changed. And we are transformed together. 
And so the Lord says, come. You know, I was reminded of this old school phrase. He says, come as you are. <laughs> I think there's this guy, now a lot of you young people won't know his name, and I'm probably showing my age. I don't know, was it George Beverly Shea that sang that song, Just As I Am? Anybody? What? Right? Okay, right? Anyway, this really old guy with a really low voice. But it's true. The Lord is saying, come and worship. Come as you are. Whether you are sad or sorrowful, whether you are anxious or calm, whether you are ready to, to celebrate and be joyful, come as you are. He says, come now to worship as we sang. You don't have to first sort it all out. I hope we never convey that message. That first sort it out and then come to worship. As though that's even possible. We can't be perfect. We need each other. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come as you are. Not sort it out first. Amen? Let, this is that place. He says, come as you are. He's inviting you. I want to invite the music team. Yeah, I'm going to get a Kleenex while the worship team comes up. I keep thinking, I need to put a box here. I don't know what happens. The video guys are getting all nervous now because I've left this camera. We need to put one of those cameras on wheels. I'm feeling a little constrained. Uh, you're thinking, he's constrained? <laughs> well, it's true. I like to wander uh, ever since I was able to walk. Imagine we come to worship. Imagine that openness. Imagine that he... Can, you, can we imagine that, Westview? Isn't that desirous to be in that place, to be together? Imagine that. That's what he wants for us. That he, what he wants for our community. And you are here. And we want to invite those that are coming uh, joining us by live stream. Just invite you. The Lord is saying, come. If, if, if you aren't in a relationship with him right now where you're on the fence or you're unsure, he says, come. Don't try and sort it out first. Just come and worship. Come to him, our good Holy Father. He's inviting you. And we're here after the service. Tosh is here. I'm here. Reese, Sarah, others, elders, talk to someone. If you're on live stream, call us, email us, text us, whatever. I wonder, as we look into the fall, I wonder if some of our worship service, or maybe we could call them prayer and praise services, where, you know, the pastor doesn't preach that much at all, but we spend time in music and in prayer, maybe sharing some testimonies, and we just, there are just occasionally, we just do, do that. Pray and give testimony and share and sing and worship. Amen.